So let's turn the turn on the recording. Okay, so um, two bar is always identical to a reflection. And that's not uh, quite so obvious. So I would like to illustrate by one example that uh, it is really true. Um, so for instance, we know that in a water molecule, H2O, we have a mirror plane that bisects here the water molecule. Okay, so as we carry out that, um, um, symmetry operation, H, H, H2 and H1, they swap up, they swap up their positions. Okay, the oxygen stays at its position. So now we can also rotate, rotor invert um, around an axis with the order two in order to do achieve the same transformation, okay? So I sh can show you this the following, and it's not obvious to see where the two-fold axis is. So the two-fold axis in this case is here, but it's an improper axis. That means if we rotate around this axis, then we do not um, produce a molecule which is superimposable with the original one, okay? So what will happen? Well, this H here will actually well, move over there. This H, this H here will be rotated here to this side. And the oxygen, well, it will not change its position. Clearly, we can see that this molecule here is not superimposable with that, okay? But if we do an inversion to the inversion center in the center of the oxygen, then we actually move H2 here th through that inversion center to the other side. And we will move this hydrogen here through the inversion center to the other side then our molecule will look like this. And you see that now we can superimpose it with the original molecule. We can also see that H2 and H1, they have swapped up their positions. And effectively we have done the same as, uh, as though we have reflected. So now by convention, we do not use um, rotor inversions of the order one and two. By convention, we use the inversion and the reflection. Why is that? It, it's simply because the human brain more easily can invert and reflect rather than rotor invert. Because a rotor inversion requires two steps that you have to do within your head while inversion and, and reflection only requires one step. That is because those um, symmetry operations are conventionally used and not the one bar and the two bar rotation inversions. So I don't know why again my PowerPoint slide does not move forward. that because the computer works so slowly for a specific reason. Okay. So now we have found all um, symmetry operations and elements that there are. Um, let us practice this a little bit by determining all possible symmetry 
operations for um, a particular molecule. So we've previously used the BF3 molecule. So let us just stick with that. So you know that the BF3 molecule is a trigonal planar molecule. Let us see what symmetry operations we do have here. So certainly we will have the identity operation. Okay. In both formalisms, they are uh, they can be expressed by a simple e. Also in the Hermann Maguire formalism, also just a one could be used instead of that. So then. Um, the Schoenflies symbolism would identify um, a horizontal mirror plane as well as three vertical mirror planes. We have discussed them previously already. So the horizontal mirror plane is within the plane of the molecule, whereas the vertical mirror plane, the vertical mirror planes, they actually go through the three BF axes. Okay, so those mirror planes are certainly also present in the Hermann Maguire formalism, but I would just say that there are four mirror planes and do not distinguish them. There are just four M. So what uh, proper rotational axes do we have? So we can first look for the principal axis and the principal axis, and we also discussed that in the last lecture for the BF3 molecule is a C3 axis, which goes through the Born atom and stands perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. And we would symbolize this by um, a C3. Now, when we look at the number of operations that we can have associated with these uh, C3, then that's actually two. Why is it two? Because um, when we have a C3 axis, we can rotate three times until we reach the identity. So that means that the first rotation is unique. And that rotation is around 120 degrees. The second rotation is unique, which is effectively a rotation around 240 degrees. And then the third rotation would be a rotation around 360 degrees, which would be the same as the identity. So the identity we already considered previously. So it's not really an independent symmetry operation. Okay, so therefore we have only the C31 and the C32. So we have overall two um, C3 symmetry operations to consider. Okay. So um, in the Hermann Maguire formalism, we would say that we have two, three, yeah? two operations around an axis with the order three. So in addition to that, we also have C2 operations. <coughs> C2 operations. In the last class we saw that these C2 operations are around a proper rotational axis that go through the BF bonds of which we have one, two, and three. Okay, so now how many operations do we have overall? Well, when we rotate around 180 degrees, then we reach the identity when we rotate only two times. Therefore, for each um, proper rotational axis, there's only one symmetry operation. The C31 symmetry operation around 180 degrees. Now, because we have three axes, we have overall three um, operations to consider. So lastly, um, we have uh, two S3 symmetry operations to consider. So we have actually an S3 
improper rotational axis and that S3 improper rotational axis just stands where the proper rotational C3 axis is. So it goes to the center of the born atom and it stands perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. So how can we see that this uh, symmetry element is there? Well, we only need to show that we can rotate by 120 degrees and then reflect perpendicularly. And then the produced molecule will need to superimpose the original molecule. Okay, so let's do that in our mind. So if we rotate by 120 degrees, uh, the Born atom will not change its position, but the three the three fluent they will move around. Actually, they will remove they will move counterclockwise. So this one will move here, this one will move here, and this one will move over there. So then our molecule already superimposes, and that must be so because we also have a C3 uh, present, but it will also superimpose when we do an additional reflection. Okay. So the additional reflection will be done at a reflection plane, which is within the plane of the molecule. So you see, when you reflect within the plane of the molecule, then none of the positions of the atom, atoms changes. But again, that doesn't mean that uh, um, we do nothing because still we move every point which is above the plane, below the plane, every point in space which is below the plane, we will move above the plane. Okay? And that proves that the rotation reflection um, S3 is, is really present. So why do we have two of these overall? That is because we have to rotate overall six times in order to reach the identity. So three is actually an odd order. Okay, so we have to rotate, reflect um, uh, two times three is equal to six times in order to produce the identity. So that would argue that if we have six rotational reflections that we would need to consider, but it's actually two. So why is it only two? This is because four of the six rotation reflections can be expressed by other simpler operations that we have already previously considered. Okay. So actually only the uh, S31, the first rotation reflection is unique and the S35 rotation reflection is unique. S35 means that we rotate and reflect five times. Okay, so the, the, S, the S32 is actually the same as a C31. The S33 is the same as just a, a horizontal reflection and the S34 is the same as rotating properly around an angle of 240 degrees. Okay, and all these symmetry elements we have previously considered. Of course, the S36 would be then identical to the identity. Okay, so when we count symmetry operations, it's, it's important that we count each operation only one time and we on, we always list the, the most simple um, symmetry operations and then more complex symmetry operations that just duplicate that more simple symmetry operation are not considered anymore. So for that reason, um, only the um, S31 and the S35 symmetry operations are unique symmetry operations. So now what about the hammond maguire formalism? Well, um, for the three C2 operations, well, we would write three, two, 
And for the 2S3 um, operations, we would write 2, 3, bar. So now, um, once we have found all the symmetry operations associated with a particular object, such a molecule, we actually know all that we need to know about the symmetry. This, this set of symmetry operations describes um, the full symmetry um, of an object. And um, a set of symmetry operations that describes the full symmetry of an object defines a point group. Okay, so a point group um, is um, for a mathematical point group, a, a group which has at least one invariant point. That means a point that doesn't move around as we carry out the symmetry operations. In this case, this would be the uh, center of the, of the molecule here. So any object uh, belongs to a point group and a point group is being expressed by a point group symbol. So for instance, that set of symmetry operations here defines the Schoenfleece symbol D subscript three H in the Schoenfleece um, symbolism. Um, in the hermann magua symbolism, the respective symbol would be three bar M, okay? All right, so we actually know now everything we need to know about the symmetry of molecules. I've kept this fairly short. I could teach a much more extensive version uh, of what I just taught in my other course, Chem 307, 407, which deals more with molecular structures, in particular coordination compounds. Um, so if you uh, take this course, you can hear a much more extended uh, chapter about the symmetry of the molecules. I do not want to duplicate what I teach in another course here too much, therefore I keep it here uh, to, the, to the very minimum, and I would like to continue now with the symmetry of extended solids, which is not part of uh, the chem 307, 407 course. Okay. Symmetry of extended solids. What is different to the symmetry of molecules? Well, first of all, we need to distinguish between two different types of extended solids, so-called crystalline solids um, and amorphous solids. So the crystalline solids have um, what is called translational symmetry. Um, translational symmetry does not exist in molecules because molecules by nature are not periodic structure. When you have a crystalline extended solid, then you have a periodic structure in which you can actually shift all the atoms in that uh, structure by uh, a specific vector. Um, actually many of these in, 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 in different directions, and then the structure will superimpose, okay? And that means that the structure has translation asymmetry. We can translate the entire extended solid crystal structure um, along a certain vector, and after we've done that, well, the structure will be indistinguishable from its original form. Okay, so for instance, one translational vector that does that is this one here indicated in red. So you see here overall, the sodium chloride crystal structure with a periodic arrangement of sodium plus and chloride minus ions. And you can see when you put yourself on one chloride ion here, then you can translate this chloride ion along this vector and this chloride ion will then superimpose this one. Okay, if you do the same trend, 
the same movement with all chloride, all other chloride ions, then you will find that after you have done the translation, um, the chloride ions will superimpose again. And that will not only be true for the chloride ions, but also for the sodium ions. If you translate them along the same vector, again, all the sodium ions will superimpose. So overall, the entire crystal structure will superimpose the original crystal structure. And that means that translational symmetry is present. So not all extended solids are crystalline solids having translational symmetry. You can also have so-called amorphous and non-crystalline solids. So they lack translational symmetry. They still may have uh, <coughs> short range order. So that means that um, each atom may be surrounded by other atoms in a particular distance, but despite that, there is no uh, periodic order of the atoms in that um, extended solid state, extended solid state structure. Therefore, these amorphous solids only have local symmetry, but they don't have long range order. They have no translational symmetry. So in the context of this course, we will only consider crystalline solids, but not amorphous solids, but you should be aware that a number of extended solids are also non-crystalline. So for instance, glasses are non-crystalline. Any silicate-based glass would be a non-crystalline extended solid. So they are important, but their symmetry is, is, is not straightforward to describe and we are omitting um, amorphous solids uh, for that reason um, as part of this as part of this class. Okay um, now which symmetry elements and symmetry operations can we have in a crystal extended solid? Okay we have previously termed we have translational symmetry but there's an interesting um, effect associated with the translational symmetry. Um, it eliminates um, certain other symmetry elements and symmetry operations. So in particular, we can only have proper and improper rotational axes with the order one, two, three, four, and six, yeah? or one bar, three bar, four bar, six bar. We can also have uh, mirror planes, which would be the same as uh, a two bar. So why is that? So why does, for instance, um, translational symmetry excludes the presence of a five-fold axis or seven-fold axis or an eight-fold axis? So that is essentially well, a floor tiling problem. So we can show very easily in two dimensions that only trigonal, tetragonal, and hexagonal symmetry are consistent with translational symmetry. So you can very easily imagine that you can take triangles and fill out space completely by um, arranging triangles in a periodic fashion. Okay, the same also works with, with squares. Yeah, you can add squares, well, next to each other so that basically the two dimensional space is filled out completely or that your, your floor is completely tiled with the squares. So you can also use hexagonally shaped tiles. Also with hexagonally shaped tiles, you will be able to floor without leaving any voids in between these tiles. Okay, But this is not possible if you use pentagonal tiles or tiles with seven corners or eight corners or nine corners. Okay, And for that reason, 
pentagonal symmetry is excluded. Only hexagonal, uh, fourfold symmetry, trigonal symmetry, and twofold symmetry um, is allowed. This is not only true for two dimensional structures, but this is also true for three dimensional structures. Okay? So that means that in uh, extended solids, the number of point groups is, is, is finite. In molecules, this is actually not the case. So in molecules, you can have axes with a very high order. Yeah? You can even have uh, uh, um, proper rotational axes with infinite order when you, for instance, have a cylindrical molecule. Okay? For that reason, you have principally an infinite number of possible point groups. Okay. In uh, extended solids, with translational symmetry, we have a finite number of point groups just because of the very limited number of symmetry elements allowed them. So these point groups are also called crystal classes, and there are 32 of them in three dimensions overall. So this is a very important uh, point that you need to keep in mind. The number of symmetry elements are restricted to uh, trigonal, tetragonal, and hexagonal axes. Mirror planes are allowed and the number of point groups, crystal classes, is restricted to um, 32. All right, so now how can we best describe uh, a crystalline solid um, with a particular symmetry? So you can describe it um, by describing its crystal structure. So the crystal structure is made of um, two components the lattice and what is called the basis or the motives. So the lattice is a mathematical construction. It defines an infinite array of points in space in which each point has identical surroundings to all others. Okay, And then the basis is placed within the lattice following the symmetry of the lattice. So the basis is actually nothing else but the atoms within the lattice. So both the lattice and the motive describe the overall crystal structure. So the basis can be on lattice points, as shown here, but not necessarily so. Okay? Therefore, a position of a lattice point always needs to be distinguished from the position of an atom within the respective lattice. So now when you have an extended crystalline solid, you basically have an infinitely large structure because of the presence of periodic periodicity, um, because of the presence of translational symmetry. Now we need to think about how can we express that uh, periodic structure in the shortest possible way. And um, in order to do that, so we have to define a repeating unit of that crystal structure. Okay. So there, this, this repeating unit defines a cell within the crystal structure. There are two different cells that we know. Um, the first one is called the primitive cell. So this is the repeating unit, um, the simplest repeating unit, the simplest cell that contains one lattice point. Okay, um, so here there are different cells defined. So all these cells, they represent repeating units. Okay, but uh, um, they are not all a primitive cell. So the primitive cell 
would be a cell that contains only one lattice point. Okay, so this here would be a primitive cell because it only contains one lattice point. It seems to contain four, but you see here that each point is being shared by four other uh, primitive, primitive cells. Okay, um, therefore each point only counts by one fourth, and four times one fourth that gives only one. So this here would be would be a primitive cell. It would be this cell with the smallest possible volume. So this is, by the way, not only the, not the only way you can define this primitive cell. You can, for instance, shift this cell by a half lattice parameter in a particular direction. So for instance, this cell here would also be a primitive cell describing, well, describing the lattice. It is this cell shifted by um, half of a lattice, lattice parameter. So in addition to the primitive cell, we also know the, the so-called unit cell. So the unit cell is the smallest repeat unit um, which shows the full symmetry of the lattice. Okay, so because of the importance of, symm uh, of symmetry, um, we not necessarily look at the smallest, smallest possible cell, but at the smallest possible cell that shows the full symmetry, and that is the um, unit cell. All right, so now we have defined the, um, what a lattice is, what a uh, motive is, what a crystal structure is, and what a primitive cell and a unit cell is. I see we are out of time and therefore we will stop at this point and we will continue then um, in the next class and I will stop the recording now.